Hey everybody, I am live today talking test automation as part of network modernization programs. Super excited with the guests I have here today. And just to preface as, as a geek, you, you may be aware test automation is the secret sauce for speeding network upgrades. We're gonna dive deep into that theme, talking about how automation can boost not just productivity, but save you money on CapEx and OpEx. Uh, for the win, and an uh, amazing sponsor today at Spiron, who, as many of you know, are leading the way in 5G SD-WAN uh, testing and validation verification with Cutting Edge Lab and test automation tools and practices. And this is really about moving the industry forward to a world where, you know, a vendral neutral expert can can add value across many different uh, technology platforms. And Spire brings some really unique insights and expertise in this space. You know, it's not just about the tech itself, it's about partnering with experts that have the kind of skills we're gonna see today and bringing those skills to bear on solving problems and adding value. So really, it's about kind of a new approach to uh, tech upgrades, tech modernization and adopting new technology. Having said all of that, uh, I want to introduce our guests here, you know, some really uh, esteemed uh, industry experts, um, many decades in the industry. I'll start with Raj, VP and head of global business services. Raj, how are you? Maybe introduce yourself to the viewers. Very good. Thanks, Evans, for having me here. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be joining you in this uh, streaming session today. Uh, as Evans said, I'm Raj Balasubramanian. I'm the VP and head of the Global Business Services of Inspirant. Uh, been close to over two decades uh, uh, in the technology industry, primarily focusing on services and most importantly, you know, providing uh, value to our customers. So more about me later in this uh, session today. Thank you. Fantastic. And we're going to come back to Raj and Chris. Good to see you again. How are you? Good. Thanks, Evan. Thanks for having us. Yeah, introduce um, yeah. yourself, a little bit about your bio and background, your role at Spiron. Sure, sure. Yeah, my name is Chris O'Loughlin. I'm based here in uh, lovely Jersey City, New Jersey today, where it's uh, record temperatures like the rest of the country. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I am, I, uh, Raj and I are partners in crime here, and I, I head up our, uh, our global uh, managed solutions organization. Um, you know, touching all aspects of our customer base around the world, um, all of our products and services. So, you know, really, really delighted to be here today, Evan, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing some of our, our insights and knowledge. And I'm really excited to have this conversation. Let, let's start with Raj. I have a bone to pick with you, Raj. You, you talk about technology-led solutions in the session description here, which was uh, given to me by you. Aren't all business uh, uh, you know, tech initiatives, technology led these days in our space. So uh, what do you mean exactly when you said tech led uh, uh, versus emotion led or business led? Yeah, it's an interesting question you ask him. Uh, technology led solutions and transformation, I think two terms that you brought about in your question, right? Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's important to dwell more into it. At Spiden, right? Uh, we are we are a company that that does amazing products right uh, we realize technology and we've been uh, pedigree has been products for many many decades and we've been successful at it somewhere down the lane we uh, uh, we find it extremely important to help our customers uh, address and exceed their objective from a transformation standpoint so we're talking of network transformation in this session right so talk of 5g or sd wan all these are new technologies that's getting incubated our customers want to I mean, want, want to want to ensure that they're going to be first to the market. More importantly, I think they want to ensure that the customers, you know, are, have a good uh, experience from a services standpoint. And that's where I think Spirant has a very uh, uh, clear niche in the market because, on one end, we realize technology, and when we package that with solutions and services, there's a compelling, uh, you know, a need in the in the market that we uh, uh, that we that we that we resolve today. Right. When you combine these two and help our customers, you know, in their in the journey of transformation, be it rolling out 5G or being uh, validation of SD WAN solutions, or look like things like uh, just not just not technology, but processes like 
CICD or continuous transformation, right? All of these are things that we do extremely well. And I think it's time that, you know, we take it to our market and help our customers be successful. And that's the reason our services is packaged and positioned as something that's technology led because there are very few players in the market that can address technology transformation today. And Spirant is one of those very few options in the market today. And hence, yeah, it's technology led solutions and services that we pride ourselves on at this point in time. Yeah, well, that, that's uh, it's good to know. And we're going to learn more about the approach you're outlining here. But first, Chris, just a uh, you know question for you in this brief. I I kept hearing Spiron talk about being the capital T-H-E leader in 5G lab and test automation. That's a pretty strong statement. Uh, how did you come to that conclusion, you know, beyond just uh, the usual marketing verbiage? Yeah, that's, it's a great question, Evan. Um, I'll give you my, my spin on it. Look, uh, we do have, as Raj mentioned, you know, best in class products, right? We're, we're long known in the, in the industry and in the sector for our, our uh, pedigree and our, our DNA around testing. And, mm. you know, I can, I can pull out any number of folks from our company and they can go into the weeds on that. And, and that is, a, that is foundational, right? We can't, we couldn't be where we are today without that. It's uh, it's an absolute requirement. It's like getting your, your, your MD degree before you actually go practice medicine. You have to have that, <laughs> right? But <clears throat> what, what I think sets us apart is, is much, is far beyond that, right? It's, it's, it's our experience it's our focus on the outcomes of our customers, right? Anybody can go out and 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 um, peddle uh, their their wares, right? But if you don't understand the the why, the why uh, of our customer base, then you know you're you know anybody in the space is pretty much going to be limited to just their products, right? And just and we we aspire and are been producing and and capitalizing on. Um, our relationship and our place in the ecosystem, this this broad ecosystem, to help our customers solve much much bigger problems than just take our product and install it, you know, and 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 we'll teach you how to use it, right? Um, we five uh, G, for example, right? The why uh, of five G is not just te- not just teach me how I can test uh, PCF better because I used to only know how to do PCRF. Let me learn how to test mm. PCF, right? Yeah, we can do that. Fine. Uh, the real why is um, how do I um, accelerate my time to market so that I can increase my ARPU and simultaneously reduce my costs and keep up with this um, never seen before um, velocity of uh, release streams that are coming from a multivariate of vendors, right? It's a, it's a minimally 10x problem that this generation, this tech generation is facing in network, minimally 10x more complex. OK, wow. it, it the, the benefits are also probably more than 10x, but the complexity is 10x. So we, we're different because we focus on the outcomes. We don't go into our, our our engagements and just say, hey, let me help you test that thing. We say, hey, what are you trying to achieve? And, and the reason I talk about that is, is the group that Raj and I are represent within with Inspirant um, was formed about three or four years ago by by our board and our CEO. Uh, to really focus on helping our customers solve these problems with outcome-based managed services engagements, right? So we put feet on the street or people back in rooms, you know, whatever is required to help them solve these these very complex problems focused on their KPIs. And and it's been a big success. I'll just end with the reason we went here is our customers were always asking us, how do I do this? Great. You've got a great product, but how do I actually solve this problem to get this product to market and, and satisfy my customers? So I don't know if that helps, but where we sit in the ecosystem and our experience and our expertise is what differentiates us. I think that says it all. My my big takeaway, 10x in complexity of networks and beyond these days. That is quite a challenge. And I think that's where the A word comes in, Raj. Automation is not just uh, nice to have, it's a must. But given all that complexity of cloud native and virtualization and decentralization and, you know, geographic uh locations the devil's in the details how do you how do you think about you know automation in that context i mean automation is everywhere right just not about networks i mean at homes we have automated sensors 
we want everything to be done at the touch of a button. We are grown lazy with time. We don't want to do hard work, as you I mean, as you can relate to. So yeah, automation is, is, is important, right? Uh, especially uh, uh, with the ag- with the disaggregation of networks. You must have heard of uh, the software defined network and virtualization, right? Where things are moving virtual, things are moving to the cloud. So there are a lot of things that has to be done uh, as uh, as a, as as a precaution, right? You, you got to preemptive task, and all of that really we cannot afford to have a lot of manual work. It's because time is of the essence. Latency got to be low. So when you look at all of these things, automation is the answer, right? Uh, the industry has evolved, right? Uh, today we talk about uh, just not doing development and testing in a sequential way. We got to develop, mm. test, deploy, right? Probably in a, in a matter of minutes. And the enabler for us to do that is automation today, right? So um, if you don't have automation, I think we go back to a classic problem of uh, high OPEX, right? To maintain what's there or, or a problem of, you know, making budgets available to build something new. In the absence of a roadmap of automation, I do think none of these would get done efficiently. And that's where I think, right, having uh, having a solution that eventually gets automated in quick time and thereby ensuring that you're able to scale your business, uh, given that, you know, I mean, 5G is all about, you know, delivering 5G as an example, right? You want to watch gaming on your mobile phone. You want to stream live video. I'm sure some of us are streaming videos on their mobile phones as, as they're traveling to work or as they're traveling to meetings. And, and for you to scale, I think you need to deliver your software faster. You need to deliver applications faster. And again, the enabler for that is only going to be automation. When you blend AI and analytics in an automated fashion again, the results are out to see in terms of the quality of you know the network uh, that, that's providing to the uh, end, end customers. So aspirant to embrace automation in a big way, right? Uh, just not the products that we have. We have meaningfully reimagined business in terms of, hey, how do you use these products which can develop a framework for automation, but most importantly, how does it scale for you know higher workloads as 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 more customers you know start adopting this framework, and and therefore I think you know automation is like you rightly said, it's not about a nice to have thing. It's it's an essential ingredient of any initiative across any technology space that you can imagine. So we continue to do that. We continue to invest. And most importantly, right, I think there are live solutions today that we have deployed in an automated fashion, which is reaping the benefits, right, both in terms of, you know, an efficient operating model, as well as, you know, a cost-effective way to build new stuff from a capital expense standpoint. Fascinating. But, but Chris, I, I mean, this I, I sense a little bit of a uh, contradiction here. Uh, we, we have a, you know, incredible need to automate across our enterprise and infrastructure and networks and beyond. And yet, you know, that's a tall order for organizations whose skill sets are not necessarily in test and automation. So what do we do? Do we have to go back to school? Do we have to start beefing up our skills? Uh, how do we address the challenges yeah. of the need that's, for automation versus the it's people? It's a great point. It's a great <laughs> point. So there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple of um, uh, approaches to that. Um, number one, um, the uh, you know the the tools that are available now are much much easier to use. So mm. the average um, the average person that's conducting tests does not need to know it as much intricately as as a former generation might have. It, in fact, it would be impossible, right? I mean, the disaggregation of the core, for example, alone um, would require somebody that understands the application understands the you know the the cloud underlay as well um and and then the interoperability of all that with a multi-vendor environment so the, the those you know it, it's almost as i mentioned before with the complexity it would almost be impossible to find somebody who, not to mention security with all the expertise around that so a lot of the tools these days are much more abstracted um uh, right so it's it's it, you know you can do a lot more with drag and drop um kinds of of applications but one of the things that we do um you know as part of our managed solutions engagements is that we will come in and for example we'll talk a little bit more about this later but for example we can help 
not only establish the, the framework and the fabric to um, uh, build an application, uh, an automation um, environment, automated environment, but we could take help take uh, an antiquated or a manually executed library and automate that within a relatively short amount of time mm. um, as a kind of a, a service. And in the process, teach, teach our customers how to use um, some of the more modern methods uh, for conducting, you know, automated um, testing. And so, yeah, it, it's not an overnight thing, but um, it's, it's actually not as hard as, as one would, one would think to, to get to the next level um, in that regard. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, I'm really optimistic about that based on what you said. And, and Raj, you know, this isn't just about time to market, which you mentioned, but there are other many tangible, intangible benefits. What, what, what say you in terms of, I don't know, productivity, OPEX, CAPEX savings, NetEx savings and optimizing? Uh, the list must go on and on. No, absolutely. There are many intangibles. I mean, look at this. Look at look at also the, the culture aspect of it, right? I mean, one is obviously the numbers by embracing automation by looking at you know new technology incubation. You make it relatively easier because it's a given, right? Uh, we learn along with our customers when it comes to new technology. Standards are evolving, right? So when new standards come, it's not it's 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 not a question of you know having a reference of having having done this somewhere. So the customers as well as us learn together and implement it. And that's where I said there's a niche as far as new technology transformation programs are concerned. But beyond that, when you look at the culture and the skills aspect, I think it's extremely important to uh, recognize and appreciate it. Uh, remember, I spoke of DevOps, right? I mean, today there are companies that basically release code by the minutes, if not the days, right? Though, Gone at, the, gone at the time that you have software releases where you've got to wait for six months or a quarter or a year. You actually get software releases every day, right? So from a cultural standpoint, how do you, how do you be agile? How do you be nimble? Uh, how are you flexible to ensure that, you know, what gets developed, gets tested, gets launched, as well as, you know, uh, you get feedback from customers. So all of that has to be done in minutes. And that's where the intangible comes in terms of the mindset that we all have to embrace as far as rolling out new technology is concerned. And therefore, the processes, the technology, as well as the tools play a very important uh, uh, role when it comes to these challenging uh, challenging initiatives. And therefore, right, uh, the, point, uh, the point I'm trying to say, I mean, along with commercial benefits, I think there is an aspect of you know, motivation. There's an aspect of challenges that, you know, that, that the workforce will have to embrace for these kind of initiatives. And we at Spirant are enabling that change, just not inside within the company, but as well as in the market. Because if we can roll out products, if we can roll out solutions that impact the velocity in which you know these changes happen, that's a win-win for the customer as well as us, right? And that's the initiative we've been working for almost four plus years ever since you know Chris and I uh, started to you know look at this managed solutions portfolio with Spirant. Right, it's the, it's like a stealth startup. We do everything. There are no boundaries in terms of as long as you know uh, it, uh, it positively impacts the customer as well as our business. There are no boundaries that we draw in terms of what can be done, right? And therefore, right, that is rubbed off in uh, in the way our solution offers as well as our products has been taken to the market and eventually, you know, our, our ability to execute projects. So the intangibles are quite a lot. Because there's a thrill in seeing some of these technologies realized with top tier customers, be it, be it service providers, be it equipment manufacturers, and in the recent past, hyperscalers as well, because they have an aspiration to also start uh, rolling out enterprise, uh, enterprise mobility, right? And for them to do that, I think this flexibility in terms of solutions and eventually generating outcomes, right, in a way that that is... Uh, 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 that is not too heavy on your wallet. At the same time, ensuring that you know you roll these services out to the market in quick time. All these are enabled, right, by this by this uh, strong blend of tools, technology, as well as people that we take along as as, as a whole package to our customers. And more to so be I done. like what I'm hearing, um, but where do we start? Uh, it's always the question. Uh, 
So, Chris, where where do yeah. we start given all yeah, these challenges and complexity here? Yeah, great. This is, thanks for pulling the slide up, um, Evan. And you know, I think Raj uh, set us up well here. I mean, this is um, this pictorial right now. I, I like to refer to this as sort of a an abstracted time and motion um, um, study, and and it's based, by the way, based on um, real world. Um, work that we've done with a multitude of customers in every part of our ecosystem, whether it be a NEM, um, a carrier, a government, uh, some other type of an enterprise hyperscaler. This problem exists for most organizations that do any kind of large scale testing. So if you look at the top uh, swim lane, you'll see a, a representation of uh, what Raj was talking about in the old way, right? Or current way for many people, which is many organizations, which is still very manual, right? Four basic areas of, of time consumption around uh, uh, test setup in these complex labs, right? There's the setup. What a setup means, I have some sort of a topology or, or a context that I need to set up to test, right? Usually those, those can be, Simple to very, very intricate because they're representing some sort of a network out in the real world, right? Um, then the big light blue, aqua light blue box in the middle there is the is the execution part. And again, de depending on how complex this the test case set is that you want to run, um, you know, we've seen this. This is a, a case study, but we've seen this, you know, run on average ninety days in some time, in some cases, right? Um, then you have what happens after you run all those tests. You have to, you know, look and analyze the, uh, uh, you have to report on it, right? And then you have to analyze the reports and make some determinations and, you know, what, what failed, why, and more importantly, not what failed, because th that's the whole point of testing. Something should fail. Mm -hmm. You're looking for failures, trying to create failures, but why? Why, right? So the analysis is a, is a very, very, very important part of this. In fact, arguably the most important part, because that's what's going to help you avoid these problems in, in the future and in the in the production network. But this is sort of the classical time and motion approach. And the I will I will say for a second that the setup part is is a, is somewhat understated in the sense that um, what happens so often in, in lab environments is that there's this whole set it up, then rip it down, then set it up in some other way, then rip it down, then set it up in some other way, because you have these, mm. you know, you have discrete set of inventory that you can make use of, generally speaking, right? And, and to make that matters worse, they might be in certain geographic areas around the world, and you can only access those in that place. So, um, you know, fast forward to the solution that, um, you know, we try to help our customers with, and in, in the bottom swim lane, and I'm not I'm not reading all the all the, the bullets and such, but the, the, the basic point is, I don't know. And I don't know if you can make it out. Right. But in this particular case, we're talking about something that on average would take 18 weeks. That's no wow. joke. 18 weeks. These are complicated. I'm talking about big, you know, large scale, complex um, types mm. of, of testing. And it can be shrunk down to um, a matter of, of hours. And so the question was, where do you start? Right. Um, and, and, you know, what goes into this, what goes into this is, is some, some, um, you know, best in class tools, right. Um, that automate, um, both the lab and the test execution itself. Um, and then there is, there's work, right. You gotta, I mentioned earlier, you gotta actually get your whole library into this world, right. It's like, we've all lived through, you know, moving from one generation of technology to the other, or mm. you know, those who, who had, who had, you know, before there was camera phones, you had those little flip phone, flip cameras or whatever, and you had to get, you know, it's, you got to move everything in. Right. So um, we, this does not have to happen serially. It's important to understand that you can actually start automating the lab environment and the tests in parallel. Um, but what, but what you really want to get to, to, uh, uh, you know, realize full benefit of an uh, automated and modernized lab, you know, in, you know, setup is, is to automate that that lab fabric, right? The testing, the setup, all that setup I talked about, that tearing up and tearing down and setting up and tearing down. You want to automate that. You also want to make all of your inventory globally accessible, right? You don't want to have pockets of things that are unused and then pockets of things that are overused, mm. right? You want to ac access your inventory anywhere, anytime, um, no matter where it sits, right? And you don't want to have to worry about setting it up. You can cut that down to you know a matter of minutes. 
And then the execution um, of those tests, once they're automated, the beautiful thing is not only is the execution automated, but the regression, all the regression tests I mentioned earlier, you got to find out what went wrong. Well, I fix it. I got to test it again. That all becomes automated, right? So, um, and then many of our tools and, and, and a lot of tools out there will do um, automated reporting and automated analytics to help you identify not just when it failed, but where it failed, why it failed. Um, and these become, you know, really, really important countries. So where do you start? You start oftentimes people do focus on the automation of the lab, but the test cases can be automated in parallel. Mm. That's amazing. Well, Raj, you've lived in this world for two decades. You must see a lot of actual real world examples where this kind of approach has been successful for your customers, maybe even in 5G. Can you give us some, a story or two? Yeah, absolutely. I can walk you through some of the uh, success stories, right? Uh, um, uh, without mentioning the name of our customers, obviously. I mean, for a global equipment manufacturer, uh, we basically, uh, you know, uh, reduce the time to set up our test environments. Uh, I'm talking of thousands of test environments, right? Uh, which would take probably months to a few weeks, right? And and the way we did that was going back to the big A, as we all refer in this in the session, is automation, right? The ability to, you know, uh, 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 to mimic the profile of an environment, to instantiate it, allocate uh, the resources to that specific test bed, and, and, and then have the right users schedule time on those environments, all was done in an automated fashion. And guess what? This was not uh, local to a, uh, to a region. This was done globally. So eventually the users had the ability to actually book environments uh, uh, by, using, by, by using a portal where they could schedule the time they want. They could, they could request for the resources they needed in terms of tools and configuration, everything else. And bang, they, they had they had the environment you know up and running at the time they uh, they, they had the test to schedule. What it basically did is it shrunk the need to have multiple uh, local labs set up to do the similar testing. Rather, they had uh, you know a, a, a few labs access made, uh, which, which could be accessed globally, and therefore you know uh, testing was much more efficient. And yeah, obviously the bottom line as well was uh, 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 was extremely effective and efficient in terms of cost savings, right? So this is a classic example where we use some of our products as well as services, package it as an outcome, and guaranteed our customer the benefits of you know embracing automation in a much bigger way. Now, talking of 5G, since you alluded to it, uh, I'm talking of something which was three years ago. I mean, 5G by now is... I won't say it's dated, but it's much more mature than what it was three years mm. ago. But in 2020, right, uh, when 5G was still gaining steam, right, uh, we had a tier one service provider uh, who was eager to, you know, get market leadership, right? Uh, and in came Spiderman, right, with our, with our world-class products. We said, hey, not only you need to use the products and functionality, but you really need to, you know, uh, appreciate the workings of some of the solutions that they procure from other vendors, be it network functions, which was then called a virtual network function. Now it's graduated to something called cloud native functions, right? So it keeps evolving, right? The ability to test it, the ability to validate it, and most importantly, guarantee that the service that our service provider is launching in the market, right, uh, is, is foolproof and more, and more importantly, wows the customer, right? That's the task that we took up, you know, in ensuring that we do this end to end for this customer and 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 this is where i talk about the learning process both with the customer as well as us and most important the ecosystem during the journey of that transformation program it's just not the customer as well as us it also it was also the provider of network function that learned a lot in terms of a hey, what we need to do to optimize the functionality of the network function what do we need to do to tune it better uh what should be the stability right those important statistics were given by us. Uh, it was, I, I, there's some noise around. I just, I just join you back in a minute. Sorry about it. Yeah, I, I think uh, Raj may have a, a test lab in his uh, basement there that that's busy at work. That's right. But uh, you know, Chris, this would be an amazing approach for any telco, five G provider out there. But even an enterprise, it seems to me, could take advantage of this uh, approach and architecture 
It's, uh, you know, oh, yeah. particularly a large distributed global enterprise is almost like a telco in many ways. What, what say you? No, that's 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 exactly right. I mean, many of the many of the largest enterprises are are telcos in their own rights, and and, and in some cases more complex, because they're serving a very disparate um, sort of customer base. Some, you know, you think about large financial institutions that are supporting not just the ATM down the street, but they're supporting you know high frequency trading um, of the highest mm-hmm. value, right? And these things can't go down, right? And now you're talking more about the wireless component that's entering into the enterprise space, not just with Wi-Fi, but the, you know, the promise of uh, private, I'm not with just uh, Wi-Fi, but the promise of uh, private 5G. Right. right. Um, and the slicing capabilities. I mean, what, what needs to be supported on these, these global networks is, is unbelievable. Not just, you know, what we're used to at home with uh, streaming and interactive <laughs> gaming, right. but the, our world depends on it. So, you know, um, these things are also monitored, managed remotely. This is the other thing mm-hmm. is like globally and any time, right? We all know that there's people working around the world, uh, you know, on these things all the time. So that's another part of this that has to be, uh, be accessed, but you're right about that, Evan. Yeah. And I imagine as you drill down, it's, it's a never unending kind of circle of, of complexity. You know, are the networks getting more complex or simpler? Every time I think, you know, people bring simplicity, it, you have disaggregation now. You have virtualization in ways you haven't had in the past. Uh, yeah. Which, you, know, you know, so how do you stay ahead of the curve? I, one step ahead of the curve, at least. So the answer is is absolutely getting more complex. Um, the the benefits are, are dramatically increasing. You know, what's available in these network technologies, 5G, SD-WAN, et cetera. Nobody would be moving to these if it weren't both for the feature-rich uh, richness and also the cost. Right, the cost benefits. Right, that's the mm. that's the whole promise of of cloudification, right, disaggregation, virtualization, etc. But the complexity, and we see this time and time again, where any part of our ecosystem endeavors to start uh, testing and and releasing into their live network in the way that they used to, um, they always run into massive problems because of of just there, it's. Let's take five G one more time. There's never been a network ever like this. Mm. It's not like going from 2G to 3G to 4G. Those were all relatively similar. They were all an appliance component that the virtual, the function was a, an appliance. Mm. Appliances don't exist anymore. There's no such mm. thing. Um, 5G won't work with automation. It just won't because it's too complex, right? So I think um, maybe we have another slide here that talks a little bit about- Yeah. I mean, this is a, um, a super hot topic as you know better yeah. than I on 5G standalone yeah. deployment. You have various telcos in various stages, and it, it brings huge efficiencies and opportunities in the network. But the big question is, you know, how do we validate for 5G standalone? It's something, as you said, has never been done. Yeah. So I think this is interesting, um, you know, because w- what we'll talk about here, and I might ask you to jump forward to the other slide in a second, just to, to emphasize the point. But this, this, what, what, what we're saying here is like, look, one of the ways to handle the complexity is you got to have a framework, right? You got to have an attack plan. This mm-hmm. is now these steps up one through nine are laid out, uh, you know, one through 10 live, live assurance would be the 10th. They're laid out in a serial fashion only for illustration, right? Th- most of this happens has to happen in parallel, mm-hmm. right? But what it illustrates is how you have to break down the problem, right? So as I said before, right, look at these, these, these items, these steps, cloud infrastructure, the 5G compliance and performance, the CNF resilience, the security. Then if you're deploying ORAN as a carrier, you got to worry about that now. There's another level of disaggregation out at the edge, right? Um, wireless, you've always had to worry about. Tri- backhaul and X-Hall, you've always had to worry about. But now you have this other new edge thing called MEC, right? Mm. Um, and then, you know, as you've always had to worry about launching it and assuring it into the network. But I'd say there's about one, two, there's about four or five boxes here that never existed before. You never mm-hmm. had to worry about an appliance and the cloud part underneath it. They were one thing. That's that's all you had to worry about. You never, there's never been a 3GPP specification that had security embedded into the into the core of the specification. Um, the SCAS requirements, as they're called around 5G core security, are are have never existed before. All the encryption requirements and um, and another other aspects. There's some. There's well over a hundred requirements within that SCAS uh, specification 
that no but no network person has ever worried about. They usually just took the appliance box, sent it over to their security department who pen tested it. They sent it back and they said, yeah, it works. That's not the case anymore. Security is a living, breathing part of the core. Um, the soft, it's all software based now, right? So um, you have to have an approach. And this is one way to attack the approach. Attack it, you know, is to break it down into these pieces and to make sure that you're testing every layer and every part, um, but also the interoperability. And if you if we just fast forward to the other slide, Evan, I might be able to emphasize this a little bit more. So, you know, breaking this down, um, you know, one of the things and, and, and Raj, let us know when you're uh, if you're able to jump back in. I don't know if the noise has stopped, but I'm back. Um, I'm back. Yeah. You're back. Yeah. OK, I'll tee this one up and then you can finish yeah. it. But yeah. you know, this is uh, we, we like to you know further break this down. Right. You, you've got all these compliance issues and capacity, but now you've got these other issues around security and resilience that you never had to worry about before and scalability. And then we like to attack it from, you know, like, hey, let's look at the nodes then the adjacency, then end to end. Then what really sets us apart is taking all of that um, testing, lightweight, virtualized, um, agent-based testing, and being able to reuse it in the live network. This is revolutionary. This hasn't been done before. So, Raj, I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit. No, yeah, like like you said, right, uh, with, uh, with virtualization, I mean, uh, the onus of... Uh, uh, of the functionality lies more in the software. What I mean is there are going to be more faults in the software because what was what once a box is now a software image, right? Uh, running on a general purpose hardware. So when you look at this, right, I think I think the areas of testing has has probably tripled or probably gone 10x times in terms of you know the things that needs to test. And therefore you have the nodal test where you test something in isolation. You have adjacent where two two different uh, images or software network functions will have to be tested and eventually end to end. And not to discount the, the complexity of this, right? When you talk of 5G, you also have a, 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 a very integral component called the cloud because today it's it's going to be rare if someone says they've deployed 5G on on uh, on a piece of hardware and and something that's not hosted on a cloud. So that means that, I mean, the nuances of testing, you know, the cloud platform also becomes important and the various aspects of security that you know, Chris just mentioned about. So when you look at all of these, I think testing has to be, you know, a sort of a religion in terms of how you embrace it, how you strategize testing, and most importantly, how you execute it. Because like I said, the fault is gonna be more in software. And the sooner you find that, right, uh, the cheaper it's gonna be in terms of fixing those bugs. And most importantly, the uh, most stable, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the stability of your service along with those functions will improve with time if you can catch it much, much earlier. So these are all, I mean, in fact, I would pride ourselves saying we are one of the industries first to have actually uh, launched a 5G core test pack, which we call as L5APs in the market two years ago. And those test packs, which can, which, which can be on a subscription basis, has actually increased with time as we as as we further you know uh, unravel and discover uh, more challenges you know that the industry would face in terms of adopting 5G in a much more mature fashion. So the framework and the test methodology, as well as related aspects of testing that you see here, that goes in testing of 5G standalone, will eventually be a more of an industry standard that that I think the industry will have to eventually embrace as from from a testing maturity standpoint. So what do you yeah, think? it's great, great, great to see this presented here. And, you know, things like multi-cloud and introducing hyperscalers into the mix. I mean, this is, I hate to say more complexity, but uh, yes, that is the reality. And and Chris, one, one, one question I do have is, you know, we, we talked about a lab and we talked about production environments, but where's the boundary these days between those when you talk continuous testing and continuous monitoring yeah, you know, that's, these aren't that's, these aren't like this isn't a, a chinese wall in the old sense right i mean you, how do you what does a new world look like uh versus the old days of having just a separate lab no great 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 point evan i'm um, glad you asked that because you know a lot of these slides even have the the you know they have they kind of organize things into ways of thinking but the boundaries the problem that most companies are facing and this is not just telcos launching 5g it's also enterprises launching things like sd-wan right? Um, 
is that most organizations, I said this before, try to take their old game plan, attack plan mm. of testing and apply it to the new world. And it won't work. It just will not scale and you won't be able to keep up with it. So mm. while while you still want to break things down into logical approaches, um, the boundaries are literally have already come down. Right. I mean, the cloud all by itself has dissolved those boundaries. And I'll give you I'll give you um, there's a kind of range of examples. You mentioned public, private cloud. And that debate is always going on within carriers. It's also going on within enterprises. How much of it do we keep in in our private cloud? How much of it do we put in a public cloud? So that's a complexity issue all by itself. But then you take the pre-production world and the production world. Right. Um, And, you know, everything is moving to the cloud. And there's one carrier, there's a notable carrier, it's, you know, it's, it's been in the press quite a lot, who said, you know, they went from scratch in their 5G deployment. And they said, look, I'm not even going to waste time with a traditional lab. It makes no sense, mm. right? I'm going to start, we're going to start doing our testing right in the cloud, right out of the gate. Now, do they slice it and, you know, and cordon off parts of that? Yes, of course, logically you can do that because, you know, you, you need to have security, you know, mindful of security requirements and things like that. Um, and you don't want to impact the, the impact the the uh, production activity. But um, why set up some artificial representation? You know, now we can do a very good job of emulating things, but why not do it in the same exact cloud? Why not put that mm. what you're going to be doing to test it before you release it? Why don't you put it in the same cloud? And so these line these lines have completely blurred. And I'll just uh, give you one other thing: is that that as I mentioned before, the testing that we do now is also software based meaning that we we use these things called virtual test agents in the in, in this you know long standing practice in the pre production lab world it's not a long standing practice to employ those test test agents virtual test agents in the production world but that's our approach and you see that here the last little thing in the in the arrow there is active testing we use subsets uh, of these lightweight virtualized test agents that include the tests that we've run um, you know, the much larger test cases that we've run in pre-production, we take, you know, small non-performance impacting um, pieces of those and deploy them in the live network to get that real time, as they call it, active testing where we're injecting, um, you know, synthetic traffic that doesn't impact the performance into the live network. So we're getting real time feedback. And guess what? We can feed that back into the pre-production world. So this uh, this evolution, you know, is, is continuing uh, this life cycle continues to feed on itself. Yeah, really interesting approach. And in fact, um, you know, there's going to be even deeper dive in an upcoming webinar that Spirant is doing on, you know, overcoming some of the delays perhaps that uh, have held back standalone 5G deployment and and getting to revenue, getting to new services, new customers quickly. That's the name of the game, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, we're in the process of, of wrapping up here, but any any thoughts or key takeaways, Raj or or Chris here as we get into the final inning? You want to go first, Chris? Sure. I would just I would just leave with this. Look, if there's any, you know, um, uh, first of all, thank you, Evan. This has been great. Thanks for taking the time with us. Um, you know, if there's any any enterprises, telcos, governments hyperscalers, NEMs out there that are, are, you know, we get called all the time to help try to solve these problems, but we're, we're here. Um, we actually start all of our engagements uh, in a consultative fashion um, mm. with assessments. We, we'll do a, you know, an assessment of the way that uh, you're set up today and can just give you a view of, you know, what's working and what's not working in the world today uh, of modernization and, and automation. We'd be more than happy to engage in those conversations. So, Fantastic. Yes, I love the approach. Don't don't wait to call when there's a problem. That's right. right? Which is our human nature and business nature. That's Proactivity right. is the answer. Raj, what say you? Yeah, I just go back to where we started today, Evans. I think uh, mm. we started off with technology-led solutions and services. I think that's extremely important because, like I said, that's the niche. Eventually, our ultimate uh, goal is to be the McKinsey for services, right? Because mm. we are not we are not we're not. We're really not looking at playing in a commodity market, right? We pride ourselves with the technology that we built, realize, and 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 we want to ensure that there's more relevance, right, in terms of how we package them, 
just not his products, but also his services to solve a problem for the for our customers, right? And and for us to do that, I think it's 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 this combination of a world class, you know, product portfolio blended with services which is high end is definitely you know a good recipe for success for any company that's embracing technology transformation, right? And that's where we want to be, and that's where we'll continue to play, right? Uh, in the near, mid, and eventually in the future as well. So thank you so much for having us. Uh, I think it's, it, it was it was extremely uh, 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 an uh, engaging conversation and some some questions which really got us thinking more in terms of what more we can do. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've had some great feedback as well. Um, I, I can't believe it's September already. Uh, I'd love to, to to know what you're looking forward to professionally over the next few weeks, couple of months. I'll be at MWC in Las Vegas, so I'm looking forward to getting out in the real world and shaking hands and meeting people. Uh, what, what about you, Chris? What's on your agenda, your radar in the next few weeks? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I, I spend a lot of my time in an airplane. That sounds like you might as well. Um, 5G uh, is coming to your airplane as well, another endpoint. That's right. That's right. Trust. Yeah. Yeah. Contact, connectivity is, is, is getting a little better on airplanes. But I, I, I'm with our customers most of the time. Mm. So, uh, um, you know, a lot of time in, in, around the U.S. And um, I'll be in London next week actually visiting a customer as well. So, oh, fantastic! Um, that's most of my time, yeah. And Raj, what about you? Any any travel overseas? I know you spend a lot of time in uh, Asia. Yeah, Pac, for example. Not I, I like to be grounded, not not in the midair. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty much, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm traveling domestically. Uh, hopefully, I should see you in Vegas as well. Uh, and okay. for MWC uh, last week of September, I guess. But yeah, so far, I think uh, we've been. We've been busy building up this portfolio, right, which is compelling enough. So Chris and I pretty much, you know, uh, uh, deliberate on what more to do next because there's so much more we can do. And we're excited, motivated, and continue to, you know, I think deliver success for Spirant and our customers. Oh, that's that's exciting. And one final little fast fact, a little bit of trivia for the viewers. One of us on this call uh, was a performer at the Olympics, uh, and I, I, I just love the Olympics, I, I, and I wanted to call it up. Uh, I, I'll let the viewers guess which one of us was uh, at the Olympics as a competitor, not just a viewer, as I was. Um, I'll say it wasn't me. Just I'll start off by saying that there is no 5,000-meter walk uh, competition at the Olympics. What about you, Roger? Was it you? Were, were you an Olympic uh, athlete? I'll let the viewers no. guess. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, Evan, maybe, are you uh, sure there's not a 5,000 meter walk? Uh, yeah, I, I could be the guy. So, Chris, I, I think you're the last one left. So, yes, tell, yes, tell us, just was, give us a quick what, was, what sport yeah. did you uh, perform? Yeah, I was in the uh, 92 Olympics for fencing, uh, representing that is, the uh, that is United so fun. States. Yeah. So, thanks for embarrassing me. But, uh, <laughs> yes. Do you, yes, do you, in your travels, do you bring, you, you know, your, your sword? Sword. I'm Sometimes sorry. I do. Yeah, I still compete in yeah. my uh, my age group. Uh, so awesome. uh, I won't disclose what that age group is, but I still uh, <laughs> compete in my age group um, and internationally. Yeah, I do. I do sometimes bring them with me. That is so fun. So cool. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining. Thank and you. thank you, viewers. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.